Today we continue to investigate the digestive system and we consider in detail the structure of the stomach, small and large intestine. So, as for the stomach, it has all the same envelopes as esophagus, we have considered last lecture, yeah? and uh, it has its mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosum. In muscularis, it has a feature as except the outer longitudinal, in a circular, it has the innermost uh, oblique layer of smooth muscles. So there are three layers of smooth muscle cells and the stomach has the thickest muscularis among all the other organs of the digestive tube. As for the structure of mucosa, let's concentrate our attention on its mucosa because um, it has the most important structures, stomach glands. First, as for the outer appearance, um, macroscopically, with an unarmed eye, we can see longitudinal folds, um, which are called rugae, especially when the stomach is empty. And um, if we enlarge the surface of the mucosa, we can find a small pits or favela, uh, and on the bottom of those crypts, or on those, I'm sorry, pits, uh, we can see opening of several gastric glands. So inside pits, several glands are open, and uh, the superficial cells, epithelial cells, they produce mucus, that's why the apical surfaces uh, create this cobblestone-like appearance. Um, notice um, on the surface um, a thick layer of mucus is present, and uh, we are to talk about it in details later. In general, stomach mucosa has its um, regional features. And from histological point of view, we consider three most important regions. These are cardiac, pyloric, and fundic. As in those three regions, three general types of glands are located. And uh, in between them, glands, they shift from one type to another. So we start our um, investigation from the fundic region as it has glands with all the cell types. And after that, we'll compare the structure of the fundic region with cardiac and pyloric. And uh, before doing that, we have to uh, consider the structure of the superficial epithelial covering, as it has a very important barrier function. Inside stomach, as you know, the content is very acidic, it has a very low pH. And of course, stomach um, could digest itself. And to prevent this, and to prevent its own walls from the self-digestion, it has different mechanisms um, of protection. The first mechanism is the production of the viscous mucus. So the superficial cells, they are simple columnar, epithelial cells, and uh, they are covering or lining as well as glandular, because they not only cover or line the surface, but as well they produce mucus. So at the apical portion we can see a drop of mucus in every cell. That's why we call this epithelial tissue glandular, simple columnar glandular epithelial tissue. After that, this cells, except producing viscous mucus, dense viscous cloudy mucus, they also produce bicarbonate ions. And uh, you know that bicarbonate ions, when they interact with hydrogen, and they create a bicarbonate acid, which easily is broken down into carbon dioxide and water, two neutral molecules. In this way, bicarbonate ions chemically neutralize hydrogen ions or acid, hydrochloric acid. And then, another important protection mechanism is the secretion of prostaglandin E. This molecule stimulates the secretion of mucus and bicarbonate ions. And some drugs like aspirin, you know, very widespread drug, they block the synthesis not only of inflammatory cytokines, but also of prostaglandin E. That's why aspirin, it decreases the protective barrier of the stomach. And in this way, uh, aspirin regular uptake could affect uh, the integrity of the gastric mucosa epithelial tissue, stimulating the ulcerative gastritis. 
Okay, in pharmacology then later you will be explained this mechanism in details. Then, and uh, another protective mechanism is the high turnover rate of the superficial cells. They are totally replaced once in three to five days. In this way, just getting rid of those epithelial cells, uh, stomach protect itself from the self-digestion. Okay, so all those mechanisms should be taken into account because um, gastritis or inflammatory diseases of the stomach mucosa uh, very widespread diseases um, among people and um, you have to understand how they develop. Then, as for the stomach glands, uh, now, as I said, um, we have three types of stomach glands, fundi, fundic, orgastric, cardiac and pyloric, depending on the region. And in fundic glands, we can distinguish all cellular subtypes. That's why first we consider them and after that other two. So which cells we can find inside gastric glands? These are three types of exocrine cells. Uh, mucus, neck cells producing mucus, chief cells producing enzymes, parietal cells or exintic cells producing hydrochloric acid. Then, except exocrine cells, we also have endocrine cells, which are called enteroendocrine, highlighting that they are inside the intestine, yeah, in the gastrointestinal tract. And undifferentiated stem cells, the source of regeneration for all above mentioned. Okay, uh, as for their distribution, it is shown here. And uh, before discussing them, uh, let's look at this gland um, on a longitudinal section. These glands, gastric glands or fundi glands, they are simple, only one duct they have, tubular by the shape and branched. Simple, tubular, branched. In every gland we consider the isthmus, the narrow region, when it connects uh, to the gastric pit, then the neck region and fundus of the gland. In uh, the fundus of the gland, in the bottom of the gland, we can find um, chief cells. Chief cells, uh, they produce um, pepsinogen and weak lipase. These are the two enzymes uh, which are used for digestion. So first steps of digestion, they take place in the oral cavity, yeah, with alpha amylase. In the stomach, several other enzymes are added, but predominantly, of course, digestive enzymes work in the duodenum. They are produced by pancreas. But stomach also produces several enzymes. You have to know them. These are pepsinogen and weak lipase. Uh, so as these cells, they produce enzymes, which are proteins in their nature, these cells, they have very well developed rough endoplasmic reticulum as zero cells in the salivary glands. So they have basophilic cytoplasm. That's how we can distinguish them. After that, next type of exocrine cells. These are parietal or exintic cells. They have another function. They produce the major constituent of the gastric juice, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid breaks down all organic molecules into smaller molecules. And in this way, it helps to digest almost everything. And after that, this content goes to the duodenum, where digestive enzymes uh, break down every molecule into monomers. <clears throat> so hydrochloric acid helps to non-specifically digest almost everything. But except producing this acid, parietal cells, they have one more important function. And I want you to remember it very well. They also produce intrinsic factor, which is needed to facilitate the absorption of vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 is needed for DNA replication and is um, highly consumed by um, highly replicative cells like in the red bone marrow <clears throat> so we produce millions of erythrocytes or red blood cells every second and to produce them of course we need the vitamin b12 so in case why we talk about that because um 
it has a very high clinical significance. If parietal cells are oppressed, if they do not produce enough amount of hydrochloric acid, they also do not produce intrinsic factor. That's why patients suffering from the hyperacidic gastritis, yeah, if the acidity is decreased, uh, the same patient will be pale and uh, would have um, low hemoglobin and low red blood cell content. That's what you have to know. Because uh, parietal cells not only produce hydrochloric acid, but also the factor important for the absorption of vitamin B12, which is needed for red blood cells okay, replication. Now, as for the structure of parietal cells, first of all, why they are auxintic? Because, of course, they have lots of mitochondria, which are important for the active transport of ions, because uh, hydrochloric acid is produced by pumping ions across the membrane, and, of course, across the gradient of concentration, so energy is needed. That's why lots of mitochondria. And, um, as it is written, parietal cells have an extensive intracellular canalicular system. Here it is, intracellular canalicular system, increasing the surface area. Increasing the surface of the membrane, we increase the number of channels incorporated in it. Then, when the cell is quiet, when it is inactive, and uh, this is shown in this half of the image, this system of channels detaches from the surface and exists in form of tubular vesicular membrane system. Here you can see tubules and vesicles. They are detached one from another, they are not in contact, they do not form a continuous system when the cell is inactive. Once the cell is activated, after the food intake for example, once the cell is activated, those tubules and vesicles fuse one with another, they get integrated in the membrane, and now they are called intracellular canalicular system, which is continuous and uh, is communicated with the membrane. So the crucial question is how parietal cells are activated, and uh, there are three receptors you have to remember, and uh, it is um, very important for your future pharmacology knowledge, because Lots of people, they suffer from the hyperacidic gastritis, so they need to decrease the acidity, and they need to oppress parietal cells a little bit, yeah? So all those three receptors could be pharmacologically blocked. And to know how to manipulate them and which receptor should be blocked, you have to know uh, their function. So gastrin, histamine and acetylcholine, these are the three mediators stimulating parietal cell to produce hydrochloric acid. Okay, uh, then let's talk a little bit in details about the mechanism, how hydrochloric acid is produced, in which way. First of all, we have to comprehend that chloride ions and hydrogen ions are produced independently, so there is no hydrochloric acid inside the cell because cell can't damage itself with the hydrochloric acid, of course. So two ions are pumped independently. And um, the mechanism starts uh, from the work of carbonic anhydrase. This enzyme creates a bicarbonate acid with the help of carbon dioxide and the water. Water, together with carbon dioxide, forms the bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ion. Bicarbonate ion is exchanged with a chloride at the base of the cell. Notice that bicarbonate ions produced here to the bloodstream, they perform additional protective role because they protect blood vessels from the high acidity in the stomach. Okay, so blood circulating in capillaries, it has a little bit more bicarbonate ions for its protection. Then chloride ions are pumped through special uniporters to the lumen of the gland. So in this way we get chloride inside. Then 
uh, potassium ion is exchanged with the hydrogen ion with the help of a special pump. Do not confuse with the sodium potassium pump, very well known yeah, from the first lesson. But here is hydrogen potassium pump, quite another pump. And this is the key element in this mechanism. Because if we block this pump, we will effectively block the function of parietal cells. So nowadays, the most effective way how to decrease the acidity in the stomach is to block this pump. That's why for pharmacology, this is the target point and that's what you have to remember. So, hydrogen potassium pump exchanges hydrogen with a potassium. And in this way, hydrogen appears in the lumen of the gland together with the chloride. It forms hydrochloric acid, which works inside. Okay, let's move on. After that, after we have discussed chief cells, uh, parietal cells, we have to mention mucus neck cells. From their name, we understand that they produce mucus and they are located in the neck region of the gland. In the neck region, they can be visualized with a special periodic acid shift reaction as they contain not only water, but some carbohydrate molecules. Here, they could be very well visualized with a special cytochemistry. Notice besides that parietal cells um, are projecting outside um, in this uh, image and uh, they create something like a parietal wall of the gland, something like visceral and parietal. That's why they are called parietal cells, because in the specimen under high magnification, they project outside in this way. Notice also that infracellular canalicular system could be even seen with the light microscopy on a high magnification. Okay, so what about mucus neck cells? They produce mucus, but a little bit less viscous comparing with the superficial cells. And it is believed that by ascending upwards mucus neck cells, they turn into superficial columnar glandular epithelial cells. So something like they are not fully differentiated superficial cells. Then another important population. So after we have considered three types of exocrine cells producing something to the lumen of the gland, we have to consider enteroendocrine cells producing something to the bloodstream. That's why they're endocrine. Such cells, they have their granules close to the base, close to the blood vessels, and such granules could be seen only with the help of electron microscopy, not light. So in the light microscopy we can distinguish them on a background of chief and parietal cells. What about their types? There are two of them. One type is closed, uh, which is not in contact with the lumen. Another type is opened, when the apical surface is exposed to the lumen of the gland. Open type uh, uh, has a gustatory receptors on their surface, the same as umami receptors in the taste buds. Last lecture we considered them in the topic ton. So those taste receptors are used not to feel the taste of the food in the stomach, it is not interesting, but uh, to detect special substances there and um, in response to the presence of those substances to produce or not to produce the hormones. So open cells, they get signals for their hormone production from the lumen. Closed cells are activated in another way, maybe through another hormones, maybe through innervation. Okay, that's the difference. What is important to say about enteroendocrine cells is that they derive from local stem cells because sometimes they are called neuroendocrine cells because they have some common features with neurons. They express the same markers like chromogranin, but they are of endodermal origin. Okay? And they produce hormones with paracrine activity. Types of those hormones will be discussed later. Okay. Then, undifferentiated adult stem cells, the last type of cells in the stomach gland, these are stem cells. They are located in the neck region and uh, dividing. They give rise and replace, I'm sorry, the superficial epithelial cells and all the other cells in the stomach gland. 
So stem cells are uh, the source for all cellular types of superficial epithelial covering and um, exocrine endocrine cells of the gland. Of course, superficial cells are replaced much more quickly, once in three to five days, while the uh, cells from the gland are replaced once in several months, as they are hidden here and they are not exposed to this harsh environment. Okay, so mitotic figures could be normally found exactly in this region. And why should we remember about those stem cells? Because they are the source not only of regeneration, but also some tumors might arise from them if they are abnormally, un if they start to divide them abnormally, yeah, inadequately. Okay, let's move on. And um, now let's compare fundi glands with cardiac and pyloric, yeah. We have considered all the cellular types inside fundi glands. What about pyloric and cardiac? Why do they differ? First of all, because pyloric region is located close to the duodenum, uh, and duodenum has quite another pH, a little bit alkaline, comparing with the stomach. So there is no reason to produce hydrochloric acid directly close to the duodenum, yeah? That's why here pyloric glands are located, and those glands, they contain predominantly mucous cells. Mucous cells, they have lightly stained neutral cytoplasm with their nuclei close to the base. Moreover, this type of um, gland has a more branched appearance um, and uh, a little bit more coiled. Notice also that in pyloric region the depth of gastric pits um, is uh, higher than in fundic region, so pits are deeper. Then here pyloric region is shown in the specimen and it is um, very well seen that muscular envelope here is much more thick because uh, close to the pyloric sphincter. That's why you can distinguish this region of the stomach from fundus not only by the glands, but also by the thickness of muscularis. Notice as well that submucosa here doesn't contain any glands. So in the stomach, once again, stomach glands are located in the lamina propria, not in the submucosa. Okay. Next, uh, here the comparison is given and you can see exactly that fundi glands are much less branched, they are tubular, and uh, almost unbranched, while pyloric glands are coiled and branched. Also, you can see that in the fundi glands, uh, exintic cells are located predominantly in the upper region of the gland. They are oxophilic red in color. Then basophilic chief cells, they are basophilic in color. And uh, they represent the major, two major cellular types in the fundi glands. While in pyloric glands, you can see almost all cells are mucus producing. This is another feature. And uh, if we talk about cardiac glands in cardiac region as well, cardiac glands are branched, coiled and mucus producing. Notice also that cardiac glands um, also could be found in the esophagus. Last lecture we discussed them. So normally cardiac glands could be even mm, uh, be found in the esophagus. Um, and um, yeah, let's move on. Intestine, uh, small and large intestine. So after we have considered the stomach with all those three types of glands, um, then um, we go to the small intestine. First of all, small intestine, it has three subdivisions, uh, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And uh, in the small intestine, we have quite another internal surface comparing with the stomach. So even the stomach, uh, we had um, longitudinal folds. He had the folds turned into transverse orientation. On the surface of those folds, there are lots of villi. And uh, on the cross section, we can find that epithelial tissue not only forms these finger-like projections, but also invaginations into the lamina propria. And uh, they are called crypts or glands of Liberkun by the author. 
So comparing with the stomach, where we had gastric pits in the small intestine, we have villi and crypts, yeah, and folds transfers instead of uh, longitudinal. Uh, yeah. Why a uh, small intestine has these folds and villi? To increase its surface area. As you can see, this plica of folds, um, they increase surface area areas three times. Um, then villi, microvilli on the surface of absorptive cells um, all together, they create a surface area more than 200 square, uh, square meters. Of course, uh, it helps the small intestine to absorb uh, all the nutrients very effectively. Then, before discussing the structure of the small intestine uh, and its epithelial composition, we have to say that there are differences between the duodenum, jejunum and ileum on a histological level. First of all, if we look at those three compartments, we can see that villi are much longer in duodenum comparing with jejunum and ileum. In the ileum, those villi are much broader comparing with the previous two. Then also in the ileum we have a well-developed uh, lymphoid tissue. And a very important feature is that in duodenum, in the submucosa, we have Brunner's glands. They are mucus-producing glands and uh, they produce, produce additional portion of mucus to the duodenum to neutralize the acidic content coming from the stomach. So duodenum needs these glands to neutralize the content coming from the stomach, while in jejunum and ileum the content is already balanced, so they don't need these glands anymore. Okay, so let's uh, look at those two specimens in detail. So here is the duodenum, here is the jejunum. So what we can see, villi, finger-like projections, and crypts. Here, those invaginations are shown, crypts and lamina propria. Then, muscularis mucosa, and at last, in the submucosa, exactly in duodenum, we have those Brunner's glands. You can see mucous cells and a small portion of serous cells. In the jejunum, we can see crypts, but in the submucosa, there are no glands. Okay, so in module, in seminar lesson, you will be asked to distinguish one specimen from another. And this feature is very helpful. Then, as uh, for the villi, first, we have to know that inside the villi, in the center, we can find uh, a blind-ended lymphoid capillary, which is called lecteal. Lymphoid capillary is needed to absorb hydrophobic substances like lipid droplets or small peptides. At the same time, villi they have very well developed network of fenestrated blood capillaries. It is shown in a yellow color in a corrosion cast specimen. Blood capillaries of fenestrated type, they are needed to absorb hydrophilic substances. So all small amino acids, um, sugars, um, monosaccharides, uh, they are absorbed directly to the bloodstream and then brought to the liver. Okay, except those two capillaries, um, there is a layer of smooth muscle cells uh, oriented longitudinally. And smooth muscles, by their contraction, could decrease the length of villi, extending their diameter, and in this way, decreasing the blood, uh, decreasing the pressure inside, stimulating the absorption, just physically decreasing the pressure. Okay, so villi are immotile. They do not help to move the food. It's very important, yeah? So they just can slowly contract and relax. And by contraction, they stimulate absorption. Let's move on. Now, in details, as for the cellular composition of the epithelial covering of those villa and crypts. So, in the epithelial tissue, in the small intestine, we distinguish enterocytes and goblet cells. These are the most numerous. 
then punnet cells are hidden in a crypt, endocrine cells, the same as in the stomach, microfold cells in the region of uh, lymphoid aggregations, and tuft cells. And now every cell will be considered in details. Let's start. Absorptive cells or enterocytes. These are the most numerous cells in the small intestine. From their name you may understand gas easily its function, absorption. And uh, to absorb more effectively, they help microvilli on their surface. So on the surface of villi, we have microvilli. And if we return to the specimen here, we can see the villi. Uh, and uh, absorptive cells, they have so-called brush border. These are microvilli oriented parallel to each other. Okay, so brush border made up of microvilli. On the surface of villi, microvilli are present. Um, okay, uh, what else? Except having this uh, microvilli on the surface, there, are, um, there is a very well developed glycocalyx. And uh, in the electron micrograph, it could be seen like um, a sponge on the surface. What is the function of the glycocalyx here? Very important to retain enzymes, uh, breaking down dimer molecules into monomer molecules. So such enzymes, they perform the last steps of digestion. As we have said, hydrochloric acid in the stomach has broken everything into small pieces. And in the duodenum, those small pieces were broken by additional enzymes. And at last, on the surface of microvilli, dimers are broken into monomers, and monomers are absorbed. So, glycocalyx is needed to retain those enzymes close to the surface. Because once monomer is broken, is ready, yeah, is created, it is immediately absorbed through the membrane. Okay. Uh, working by the surface, those enzymes, um, they work in the most effective way because all their products can be absorbed. That's what we call parietal digestion or digestion close to the wall. Okay. Then, uh, except absorption, uh, absorptive cells also produce several enzymes like enteropeptidase or enterokinase. This enzyme, it activates a trypsinogen, breaking it down into trypsin. And after that, trypsin itself activates many other enzymes. As you know, digestive enzymes produced by the pancreas should not be activated there, but only once they are in the duodenum. And their activation is performed through partial proteolysis, so a piece of molecule is removed. And that's the function of enterokinase. Okay, then uh, uh, what else we have to say? That cells in the small intestine, in the large, are connected with the tight junctions. Notice that because uh, it helps uh, to prevent leakage of the content from the small intestine to the surrounding organs. As uh, here we have some poisonous molecules, maybe some bacteria cells, some so everything what is absorbed passes through the cytoplasm of the absorptive cell. Absorptive cell controls everything. So in its cytoplasm we can find also lots of uh, pinocytotic vesicles um, because some lipids uh, or peptides, uh, they do not pass through ion channels, but they are ingested by pinocytosis, as you can see, and then they are exocytosed to the blood vessels and lymph capillaries. Also, what we have to say is that water is absorbed uh, here by pumping sodium ions to the intercellular space through the sodium-potassium pump. Sodium is pumped here, creating a little bit hypotonic cytoplasm. So water is absorbed from the lumen and then is, uh, with the help of osmosis, water follows the sodium and is transported to the intercellular space. That's why sometimes space between those cells is wide, because water is transported there. 
Okay, so once again, sodium ion is pumped to the intercellular space, it becomes hypertonic, and after that, water follows those ions uh, because of the osmosis. Okay, then goblet cells. Between enterocytes with microvilli, we can find always so called empty cells or goblet cells. They really resemble a goblet with beer, like a form in the upper part as uh, they have the narrow base and the wide apex. And in the apex, uh, they have mucus, they have mucus granules, um, and uh, they can be detected with a periodic acid shift reaction. With the help of hematoxylin and eosin, they are neutrally stained. Okay. Enter endocrine cells. Again, uh, those cells um, produce hormones, or so hormone-like substances, and are divided into opened and closed type. Opened type could be found on the surface of villi, while closed cells predominantly inside crypts. And um, they derive from the endoderm and they produce hormones. Let's um, uh, talk about them uh, in details. First of all, those cells, uh, they represent less than 1% of all cells in the digestive epithelial tissue. But if we take them all together, they could represent a very significant gland. But this gland is distributed randomly inside the digestive tube um, to regulate its peristaltic uh, movement, the activity of digestive glands uh, and many other functions. Um, so together, those cells, they represent a part of the diffuse endocrine system. A part of endocrine system which is represented not by glands, but by single cells. A part of diffuse endocrine system is called a butte system. So you have to know the definition. A butte system is represented by cells with a common feature. They all can uptake amine precursors and decarboxylate them. In this way, they produce hormones out of amino acids. You know, for example, serotonin is produced from tryptophan and um, just some hormones, they represent uh, modification of amino acids. And because they have, to, they can do this, a group of cells, they have the common feature, they are called debut system. Just you have to know the definition of those two systems, that's all I ask you. Then, as for the enteroendocrine cell, each cell produces uh, its hormones. Yeah. And uh, some hormones you have to remember and know the function. First, of course, about gastrin. You have to remember because some tumors producing gastrin, gastrinoma, uh, they stimulate parietal cells. You know that parietal cells, they have receptors for gastrin. They are stimulated by gastrin. And in this way, the stomach produces too much hydrochloric acid. That's what we call Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. And uh, uh, so these cells, you have to know, sometimes enter endocrine cells, uh, they are the source uh, of tumors. Then, one of the most widespread type of enter endocrine cells, uh, these are enterochromophenic cells. Enterochromophenic cells, they represent up to 50% of all enter endocrine cells, and they produce serotonin. It is not mentioned at this table, I don't know why, but please remember that enterochromophenic cells, they are also called EC cells, they produce serotonin, which is used as a mediator in the digestive system and is important for peristaltic. But later in the topic endocrine system, we'll also investigate its role as the hormone of a very good spirit. That's why sometimes people after eating, they have good spirit because serotonin is produced. Serotonin also is the hormone of happiness like that. Okay, then gastrin we have already considered about cholecystokinin and secretin. We are to talk next lesson about pancreas and gallbladder. And uh, motilin, easy to remember because it regulates the motility of um, the gastrointestinal tube. Then, also I want you to remember that some hormones, or hormone-like peptides, are produced not only by enteroendocrine cells, but by nerve endings. So notice that bombazine, encephaline, vasoactive inhibitory peptide, 
VIP. Uh, these are the three peptides produced by nerve endings, not by entering the crying cells. Yeah. Okay, there are lots of um, other cell types, uh, but we have no time to discuss them all. Okay, punnet cells. Next type. In the bottom of the crypt, on its bottom, we can find uh, punnet cells uh, with basophilic cytoplasm and acidophilic granules. Okay, the combination of two. What do they produce? They produce antimicrobial, antibacterial peptides like lysozyme, phospholipase 2, A2, diffenzines, um, and you know that lysozyme breaks down bacterial cell wall, while phospholipase and diffenzines uh, they break down bacterial membrane. In this way, panet cells they protect crypts from bacterial colonization, as you know that in the small intestine. There are lots of bacteria cells. Some of them are friends. They are considered as the commensal microbiota, but some of them could be dangerous. Okay, and then microfold cells um, uh, or M cells. These are epithelial cells, not immunocompetent, not macrophage. They derive from the same stem cell. They are the part of epithelial covering. But they are present only above special regions called Peyer's patches. So, as you can see in this scan electron micrograph, um, inside the small intestine we can see villi, some crypts in the lamina propria, but in some regions uh, there are no villi, and these dome shaped regions um, are. Uh, characterial for crypts, for, oh, sorry, for pears patches. Uh, under them we can find lymphoid aggregations. And uh, exactly in these regions we can find microfold cells. What is the function of microfold cells? Just one important function. Antigen transcytosis. They capture antigen in the lumen and by phagocytosis and then exocytosis transport this antigen to the underlying lymphocytes. Just transport of antigen. Uh, they do not process antigen, do not present it, just transport, transcytosis. Then the last type is tuft cell. Tuft cells uh, could be found on the surface of villi and they are used as a hemoreceptors chemosensory or chemoreceptor cells, they detect the presence of some special chemicals in the lumen and uh, those chemicals are characterial metabolites uh, for some parasites like helminths, for example. In case they detect those chemicals, they stimulate uh, the immune response with the help of the T helpers of the second type. Such type of T helpers, they attract eosinophils and um, antiparasite immunity. Okay, so they are tightly connected with the antiparasite immunity in the intestine. Okay, and at last, intermediate cells or stem cells. They are the source of regeneration of all above mentioned types. So all types of cells in the epithelial lining of the small intestine derive from intermediate stem cells. Um, such cells are located in the crypts. Um, notice there are no stem cells inside villi. They are hidden in a crypts um, and there are two types of stem cells. Please be attentive. So one type is crypt based, col crypt -based columnar cell. They are located at the base of the cryptum um, and they are positive for um, LGR5 um, marker. And another type next type of stem cell is more quiet, less actively divided, and is located around four cells above the bottom. So in the region of four cells above the bottom we can find plus four stem cell. So please uh, you have to understand what does this mean plus four. Such cells are used to regenerate crypt base columnar cells in case they are damaged, in case of some infectious diseases, radiation, or some chemical mm, influence, um, if the poison was taken. Yeah. So if uh, the crypt base columnar cell 
cells uh, are inactivated, then plus four cells could replace them. Okay, so uh, those stem cells are very active and they give rise to the transient amplifying cells. So after division, they give rise to a transient population, which divides several times more, and only after that differentiate into absorptive cells, goblet cells, or enteroendocrine cells. So inside the crypt we can find mitotic figures and undifferentiated cells here. So here we can see cells without brush border because they are not fully differentiated. Okay, then uh, when we talk about small and large intestine about our uh, digestive tube, we have to mention that it has a very well-developed uh, lymphoid tissue because uh, every day lots of antigens um, are ingested together with the food. Not ingested, but... Um, yeah, ingested. And uh, the small intestine, it deals with a problem. What antigens should be allowed to enter our organism as they are nutrients and we need them? And what antigens should be rejected as they are foreigners and they want to colonize us? Yeah. And uh, that's why there are an uh, there is an army of lymphocytes just under the epithelial tissue, in the lamina propria, in the submucosa. And those lymphocytes, uh, they always make this decision what antigens to tolerate, what antigens to reject. And um, uh, that's why predominant amount of lymphocytes in our organism, they are... Um, associated with the digestive system. Uh, the first part of those uh, lymphoid aggregations uh, could be found in the pharynx in form of lymphoid ring. Then we have lots of pears patches in the small intestine and uh, lymphoid aggregations also present in the appendix and along the um, ileum and colon in high amount. Okay, so in general the main function is to uh, create tolerance is to elaborate tolerance, uh, immunological tolerance to food antigens and uh, also to reject harmful foreign antigens. And uh, if some problems occur in this process, then food allergy develops. For example, if we do not tolerate the food, yeah, or instead uh, we can't reject foreign antigens. Um, in case uh, the immunity doesn't work in this way. Okay, let's not to stop. I recommend you to watch a special video. I put the hyperlink. I'll put the hyperlink in the description for more details. Okay, and appendix. Uh, after we have considered the small intestine with all those uh, crypts, villi, and cellular compositions, uh, now we go to the large intestine. And uh, here at the beginning we have the appendix, a special blind and it uh, process um, which has a special features it has lots of lymphoid aggregations um, that's what we have just discussed the function you already know and what we have to say that in its lamina propria we can find only crypts uh, no villi as this is the part of the large intestine and also it has two continuous layers of smooth muscle cells as uh, if we talk about the colon in the large intestine. In the large intestine, you know, that uh, superficial longitudinal layer is not continuous, but uh, is represented by um, strips, um, uh, so-called tenia coli. Yeah. In the appendix, the outer layer is uh, continuous. Okay, now uh, several words about uh, the... Um, Compassion of small and large intestine. In the small intestine we have villi and crypts, while in large intestine only crypts. As for the cellular composition, in the large intestine we don't have punnet cells. In humans punnet cells are absent as well as plus four stem cells. Only crypt-based columnar cells. Then, uh, as for the ratio, here in the large intestine Goblet cells are much more numerous than in the small intestine. They produce mucus in high amount here. Then also we have enteroendocrine cells uh, and absorptive cells. In absorptive cells here, they are specialized in water absorption. And as I told you, they have uh, wide spaces between the cells uh, because uh, of the active um, 
transport of water. Also in the large intestine there are lots of uh, bacteria producing some vitamins uh, and producing some enzymes helping us to deal with uh, digestion and uh, they are commensal organisms uh, so we have um, mutually beneficial interrelationships. Um, we shouldn't reject them yeah, if they do not penetrate the epithelial barrier. Okay and here the comparison of um, stem cells um, is given in the small intestine and the large intestine. Almost the same, except in the large intestine, punnet cells are not produced and there is no plus four stem cells. But also there, is, there are transient amplifying cells uh, and they early split into absorptive cells and um, all the other types. Now, a very important clinical feature of the large intestine is that uh, it has uh, very well developed uh, lymphoid tissue, of course, um, because there are lots of bacteria inside. And uh, another feature is that in the lamina propria, uh, there are no lymphatic vessels under normal circumstances. So, if lymphatic vessels are absent, any tumors appearing here doesn't send metastasis for a very long period of time. And if tumor doesn't penetrate the muscularis mucosa, then it could be excised locally and... Uh, because it doesn't send metastasis, yeah, and it is a very important um, clinical significance. Also here, under the epithelial tissue and between the basal lamina and blood vessels, um, there is a thick layer of collagen fibers, which is used uh, as the filtration network, um, controlling additionally the passage of uh, ingested materials. Um, and as well at the base of the crypt, um, around crypt base columnar cells, uh, there are proliferating fibroblasts uh, affecting those uh, stem cells as well. So um, this environment is very important for the normal uh, activity of the crypt based columnar cells. Then uh, let's move on and here the specimen is given and we have to see that uh, we have to distinguish it from the small intestine. Yes, so it could be easily distinguished because on the, sur the surface is smooth, there are no villi, there is a line on the surface. And in the lamina propria there are crypts, they are finger-like invaginations. They are represented predominantly by goblet cells, as you can see they are very very numerous, like empty dots there. Then there is a muscularis mucosa and submucosa without any glands, but with large lymphoid aggregations. Yeah. There are two layers of um, smooth muscle cells. Um, so, then, and at the end of the lecture, we have to mention the transition from the rectum to the anal canal. And uh, um, First, uh, at the beginning of the digestive tube, there is one transition from the esophagus to the stomach when epithelial tissue shifts from the straight squamous carot non keratinized uh, to the simple columnar in the stomach. Yeah. And here is another opposite transition from the simple columnar epithelial, like in the colorectal zone, to the squamous, straight squamous keratinized epithelial tissue, like in the skin. And this transition is at the site of different pathological transformations, uh, so you have to know this zone exactly. And uh, there are three regions um, are considered um, colorectal zone, anal transitional zone, and squamous zone. Very easy to remember, simple columnar epithelial tissue like in colon, stratified squamous, keratinized like in the skin and in the transitional zone respectively have a transition from one to another. And there are two types of glands you have to remember. These are anal glands. In the transitional zone they are simple tubular branched lined with a stratified columnar epithelial tissue and they produce mucus. And after that a larger Epocrine glands, uh, um, actually they are not epocrine, they are epocrine sweat glands with merocrine type of secretion. And uh, we'll talk about these glands uh, in the topic skin, because they are characterial for the skin of the axillary region, um, uh, groin and some other regions of our body. And uh, here they have a special name, circumanal glands, um, and uh, they are found in the skin. Let's look at the specimen. 
uh, here is the squamous zone with the straight of squamous keratinized epithelial tissue and here those uh, epocrine sweat glands or circumanal glands are as you can see they are located deep in the mucosa even in the muscularis and uh, in case of their inflammation it should be taken into account this is the uh, significant surgical problem so they produce something like sweat but not water but uh, more protein in content the function will be discussed in the topic skin and uh, uh, let's look at this transition so here's the colorectal zone with a simple columnar epithelial tissue here is the transitional zone when one epithelial tissue turns into another and here we can see squamous zone with its uh, straight wet squamous keratinized epithelium and then also notice here some sebaceous glands could be found and even hair follicles character for the skin okay and uh, the internal sphincter also could be distinguished here okay so in this way we um, complete the topic um, gastrointestinal tube and next lecture we are to discuss the pancreas uh, liver and gallbladder Thank you for the attention.